Uh, has anybody here heard of smart cone before? Dwayne. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's exciting to be here. I first met Cheryl at the uh, Georgia uh, Time event last year. Uh, Parsons Construction had uh, approached us and had a project where we're working together in North Dakota for the DOT there and invited us to uh, be a speaker at the Georgia event. And that was my first time meeting the traffic incident management people. And uh, it was, it's an amazing thing. I personally have been in three major accidents and first responders uh, came to uh, my rescue, I guess you could call it that. And it's, uh, it's amazing when, as a, as a victim, I guess, or whatever you call it, uh, you don't know what's happening. It's, it's a moving experience when you are a, uh, when you're in an accident, uh, three of them actually, but when the first responders show up and guide you through the process and you're confused about where you are and you know, you don't even know, like I was injured, not, not severely, but enough to know that I didn't know what was happening. And uh, I literally walked around aimlessly and first responders were taking care of my wounds and being so nice to me and all these things. And I just had these images of these wonderful people that are burned into my memory and how effectively and quickly that they uh, dealt with my situation. And so personally, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and one of them was in Las Vegas, and one of them uh, was in uh, Canada, and in both places, it, uh, it was the same experience. So thank you very much that, uh, for doing the work that you do. I know how important it is. And so to be part of that for us is, is very, it, it's incredible. And um, in the Georgia meeting, uh, one of the things, commitments that we made is, you know, from a technology company, technology companies generally like to, to you know, make money. That's a good thing, right? You make money. But uh, for our organization, it's uh, saving lives and safety is first, and making money is second. Now, we all know we have to make money to survive. We understand that. But we collaborate with our uh, teammates, uh, which are, you know, you people, to understand what makes it work from a budgetary point of view and how do you do it together that it fits the right uh, solution and that you know you guys can pay for it and you feel that there's value and uh, and that's something from you know being the CEO of the company that's the culture that I set forward on the organization and so at the end of the Georgia meeting uh, Cheryl approached me and we we had a nice talk and we developed a great relationship uh, about what the smart cone could become <coughs> and so we took where the smart cone was at that point um, and we started to develop applications to make it more flexible and useful for the traffic incident management uh, uh, group team. And um, so I'm going to go through the presentation. I'll start off with a little bit of where we were and then what we're doing. And then hopefully uh, we have some questions and feedback from everybody. That would be great. So uh, first of all, we're a service provider. Uh, from the day that we created the smartphone concept, we knew that you know, provide, we needed to provide connectivity, the processing power, the reporting, the interaction, everything from start to finish. Uh, it's nothing worse when you're trying to deal with a situation, especially when it's an important one, that you don't know who to go to if you're having a problem. So we decided to wrap it all in and we'll just be the ones to talk to you and we'll take care of all the complexities and all the challenges from a technological standpoint. So you really have one service provider to work with. Uh, on our back end, we work with companies like Verizon, T-Mobile, um, Amazon, and other big technology companies and service providers. And we have strong relationships with them to roll it into a very simple to use solution. <clears throat> our current safety programs include first responder coordination, work zone safety, and uh, bike lane signaling systems. It's also important to know that in, in order to deliver a solution and maintain a company, you can't just focus on one vertical. So if we thought we were going to you know, be wealthy just selling to uh, Department of Transportation and Traffic Incident Management, that's probably not going to work. I and mean, we knew that in the beginning. So we have customers like uh, Exelon Corp and Duke Energy and other large utility companies who use a very similar technology to deal with their disasters internally. And they have lots of money, so they, they, they know. We include them in on that uh, we want them to pay, but we want to make sure it's available for everybody. 
So we're doing our best to make sure that we can fund this and, and spread it across multiple verticals. And also, they have some great ideas and in internal uh, programs and mechanisms that they do that can also help the traffic incident management team. So we work as a, a collaborator to bring those features uh, to the team. The bike lane signaling system is, uh, again, is a very uh, interesting product. Uh, you can see we've got the little display off to the side and <clears throat> there's kind of two different versions of the product. One of them uh, looks like it has a camera on top and the other ones don't. Those, uh, those are lights and those lights will be installed on um, the uh, unsignaled intersections where bikes are driving past, <coughs> like they're going through the intersection. And then cars sometimes, if they don't see the biker, then there's a potential collision. And uh, that's happened a lot everywhere. Uh, in Ottawa, there's been a couple of fatalities. And so we developed the bike lane safety system. And again, it was using the same kind of signaling uh, technology that both the utilities and traffic incident management were looking for. So it was a really great opportunity to include another municipal uh, group. So just to get a little techie, um, and I'm sorry for that, I am you know, a product company, I love technology, so just to run you through what's inside the cone. Starting at the top, we have a single sensor 360 degree camera that um, it's a fisheye camera, so we de-warp that so that you know, as humans we can see what it looks like. And then we have a, uh, a quad-core computer inside, and what that means basically is we took the power of a cell phone, a personal cell phone, and we built an industrial grade cell phone that does a lot of the same features and functions and put it in the tube over there. And that allows us to do all sorts of computing and data gathering without having to be connected to the internet, which is a, which is a, uh, a very useful thing if you get in an area where there's no coverage. We have uh, microcontrollers and sensor inputs inside it as well. That's important for things like if you have a biohazard situation, maybe a methane leak or something like that, that we have little sensors you can put around so you can actually gather the information in the data from those and it can again be gathered and processed and held inside the smart cone. We uh, included a multi-dimension uh, multi, uh, uh, communication system so you can do cellular, Wi-Fi, whatever kind of communications you require. It's a modular approach. Batteries. The LEDs that are flashing over there on the, uh, on the smart cone, we call that uh, actionable intelligence. Uh, you know, marketing term, I guess. But basically, we wanted to be able to cue people uh, visually without having to rely on technology. So if it's flashing red or amber or whatever it may be, you're, uh, through different responders you can communicate that way. So a central operator, for example, would control what the colors look like to cue you to do your different roles and stuff like that. that what a better way. Your hands are still free. You don't have to be worried about your frequencies and these other kinds of things. You can look up and get your cues. If you have a crowd situation and you want to be able to direct uh, people to go a certain way, you can then, just like an airport, just put the cones in order and they'll sync with and they'll, they'll tell people where they need to go. You can turn one section off, uh, closing it off with red, open it up with green, all these different kinds of things to be able to control foot traffic or vehicular traffic. <clears throat> we have web servers inside, so uh, for responders who have smart devices or tablets or computers, they can Wi-Fi into the system, again, without having to go and have a cellular plan and that sort of thing and they'll get the full experience of what looks like a cloud server, but it's actually hosted in the smart cone. We do that because uh, we don't want you to have to get into a, a plan. We don't want you to have to deal with ongoing subscriptions to get your job done. To us, that's a hindrance. Of course we want you to from a profit center, but that's, that's not what should be in front of you doing your job and saving a life. It's more important to save a life first. And uh, another important thing is the SQL database. So we store all the information in, in an active log. So everything that happens, responders that are queued, data that's collected, the intelligent video system that can do license plate recognition and facial detection and all these other things all get stored in the cone. From a chain of evidence perspective, everything that's been recorded is locked down in the cone and watermarked and can be handed off to uh, the lawyers or whoever needs it. And that's all the information is contained in that one device in a easy to use searchable database. This is a typical scenario of what we were working with Parsons Construction uh, on. This is what started the, the, uh, the process where you have an accident 
And so now you need communications, digital queuing, and sensor gathering on site. So smart cones would be put around the accident scene to begin coordinating and then sending the information back through our 4G connection to the traffic center. Uh, when we met Cheryl, uh, Cheryl uh, communicated to us that uh, first responder coordination is one of the most important things. And we don't want everybody to have to buy cones to do it. So is that possible? And we said, absolutely. You don't need to have a smart cone to be able to use the smart cone coordination approach. Uh, the other thing we like is we like collaboration with the people who are going to use it. We don't know how to do your job better than you. You do, right? So having a focus group with you and asking you what's important to you, how, how do your processes and procedures work, and we'll quickly make the tool work for you. So over the last year, we've been working with Cheryl and, and uh, Florida DOT and some focus groups on really capturing that. So but before I get into what the system looks like, there's some rules. Number one, keep it simple. You don't want to have people distracted and more thinking more about how the heck do we use this stupid system than they are doing their job. As soon as that happens, out the window in the marsh, this thing's no good, move on and do things the way we're gonna do it. We don't want that to happen. We want you to do your job and we just wanna help any way we can. If that means not using it, then that means not using it. But you know, we'd like to see if we can help, that's the point. So our goal is to collect information as, as much as we can um, without the interaction of the, of the first responder. And oftentimes that may ha mean having a coordinator on site who's actually doing data entry and gathering information and doing those things. <clears throat> not all responders want or have devices. Uh, lots of people love smartphones and hey, why not everybody have one? Uh, lots of different solutions out there require that you do have a device. But there's a lot of things that come along with a device that people don't want, especially first responders. For example, I don't want you to know where I am. I don't want you to be, feel like I'm being spied on. I don't want any of that. I don't want my device to be taken away in case there's a lawsuit. Like there's so many reasons to not want a device in this job that to force somebody to have a device to us is the wrong thing. We should have a system that doesn't require uh, you to have a device. So, so we did. We created a system that does, you don't need to have a device. You could just literally, volunteers could come off the uh, volunteer line or however you collect volunteers and uh, they don't need to have any information. Just as long as they're helping and we know what they're doing, then you can put it in the system and track them. <clears throat> Preserving responder privacy. Through a focus group we had, um, one of the environmental people who often does support from home as a volunteer, she doesn't want the world knowing where she lives, right? I mean, if that accidentally gets, gets you know, caught into the system, now all of a sudden she's afraid to use it. So we have uh, the ability to, to not do that. So, okay, you don't want to have your location tracked, no problem. That's, a, that's an opt-in thing. It's not a forced thing. And, you know, most importantly um, is working within your budget. One of the things that I said in uh, Georgia um, was technology is really great. The concept makes a lot of sense, but then, you know, and show of hands here if you don't mind. How many people in here have a big budget for technology, like a CapEx budget? Nobody, right? So all these technologies come through and you've got, you know, that sounds really fantastic, but we can't use it. So, you know, at the end of the day, who cares? So our commitment is to enable you to have the technology, that your access to technology, and find a way with you to get paid through the incidents. So if, if there's cost recovery, for example, insurance or lawsuits and these kinds of things, because after the money does uh, get recovered or, or paid for. There are budgets and so on and so forth that go with communication, data collection, and those kinds of things. So we want to work within your, uh, your budgets to, uh, to see what can be done. And again, we're working with Cheryl's group to figure that out. So this is, what our, uh, this is the process, the beginning of the process of our uh, responder communication app. The first thing is when somebody reports an incident, the location issue that George was talking about Somebody's, you know, driving along and says, yeah, it's right here, and it's not right there. We get the same thing, by the way, with our, some of our asset tracking people. Yeah, it happened exactly at this time on this date. Really? So we go through hours and hours of video to find out, nope, it happened four hours <laughs> in a different direction, but we spend a lot of time looking for stuff. So that, that happens often. In today's world, we can uh, do things like this. For example, uh, if somebody, uh, like the Road Rangers, have a... Uh, tablet or a computer in their truck 
and they're the ones that are going to create the responder file, then we can collect the location from their browser or their GPS and automatically put it in. If somebody who uh, is driving along and reports it with a standard cell phone, then we can get the location information from Verizon, T-Mobile, and those kinds of uh, carriers to find out where the call came from. Now, of course, there's privacy issues there, and we're working through all those kinds of things, but those will, will help out a lot. The fact that you guys are putting tape on the um, reflective tape on the poles, I mean, that's genius. That's a really great idea. And so, <clears throat> anyway, so knowing the location of an accident, you start the file, and uh, my screen's much smaller than yours, I guess, so let me squint. So uh, anyway, you start the, you start the, uh, the uh, building, the, the um, incident, and you'll see here now that it says access denied, but when you come over and look at the uh, computer over there, you'll see the camera feed from our uh, 360 camera on top. And so the operators who are putting the uh, incident together, if there's a camera available at the time, they'll be able to see the live camera feed or pictures. If you don't want to have recorded video, you can just do pictures. You can also bring in cameras from traffic centers like uh, the, 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 tra the 511 traffic cams and those kinds of things. They can also be displayed here and you can have multiple cameras at the same time. And so when somebody, the operator or the um, uh, road ranger is building the event, like the incident, they can characterize it and start to add more information so that the specialist can look at it and they can, they can start to see things like uh, maybe there's a vehicle that's in the water and if that's the case then the, the hazmat people have to show up and the environmental people have to get involved, different things like that. So we provide those visuals to people. You can see on the right hand side there's, there's what's called an event log. That event log captures everything that happens within this uh, incident. Now, it's, it's important to know that we don't capture private messages. Anything that's going to go on public record does not get stored here. So if somebody's texting back and forth on their phone, back and forth about questions and so on and so forth, that, again, is an opt-in for what gets stored on the, the system. What the intention of this active log is, is what time was the responder queued, what time did the responder get there, who was queued, what time did the incident start, what time it was over, those kinds of things. And our intention of doing that is to help process improvement so that later you can look at the data and say, hey, um, and you can see actually just to support that, up there's a, right beside there's a thing called TSAR. And that's when we were calling accidents accidents, but we know we have to call them crashes or incidents, so we'll have to change that to TSAR. I know it was weird, anyway. TSAR for now. But anyway, so the TSAR, you can see it says 51. That's 51 hours. Um, that's not realistic, that was just obviously a demo thing. But the point is, from the time that the incident is reported to the time that it's cleaned up is what that number is. And it can help benchmark. And then you can look at where the responders came from and how they were queued and all those kinds of things and then start drilling down for uh, process improvements. This is some information about interacting with the first responders. And again, so some of the volunteers had said to us, we don't want to have our numbers published so we uh, put a fake number in there. You click to call, so you can actually call a first responder through the app. So again, if the uh, road ranger is on site and has a tablet, and they want to be able to call a responder and they don't have the phone number, all they have to do is hit click the call, and the cone will dial the person and bridge the call through the cone. So now you can actually talk to the person on the other end. We also have response through SMS messaging. So again, let's say, for example, there's an incident, road ranger shows up, it starts to characterize the event or somebody calls it in and it's built remotely. It doesn't have to be a road ranger. Uh, all of the available responders who have the capabilities to address the, um, the incident, no matter what discipline they are, the system will send text messages to. And then when they say they can respond or not, that's an automated process. And then the operator knows who's available, who's queued, and how far away they are from the incident. And as long as all the volunteers, all the first responders have a personal cell phone or whatever it may be, it can collect the information from that. If they don't have a cell phone and they have a home phone, then the system can call and, and, and engage them and through automated text to voice, again, say that they've been queued. And something like that's important when you think about how many people an operator would have to call to go through the list of, okay, what, okay, so you keep going, you keep going, do you find it? Automate it. That's the world we live in now. Voop, bang, okay, great. Those people have queued. Now it's a specialist, a hazmat specialist or something, or a biospecialist. 
we need to get them on the phone. We need to make sure that we've got the uh, video data or sensor data, whatever they need to help them support uh, the situation. Uh, another example is my thing, oh no, okay, good. I thought it was flipping forward for a second. You can see the green um, responders are the ones who are queued. The yellows uh, they have accepted the queue. They're actually engaged in moving towards the accident. The amber one has been queued but hasn't responded yet, and the black one has not been queued at all. That's, that's the color differences there. And so we have incident uh, listings. So, you know, obviously there's never just one incident going on at a time. There are many and multiple. And so that poses a couple of challenges. If you have a specialist who, uh, who needs to be at two places at once, and he's currently, he or she are currently active on a project, you need to be able to know that. And you need to be able to know when they're gonna be released from that project and on to the next one. So this gives us the ability to know how many active uh, events are there and what responders are currently attached to that, to that incident. And then you can continue to uh, work with them to move them around as needs be. So that's it for the, um, the responder app so far. I have an actual demo on the side that we can go through if you have more questions. Uh, this here, what, uh, what we're looking at here is um, the project that we're working with for proactive uh, roadside safety with the Department of Transportation. This is kind of where it all began. What you see is you see a smart cone and a digital signage board. And so um, uh, Dwayne was talking about the queue this morning and we met in Georgia as well. Uh, love the jacket. <laughs> So um, our, our approach to, uh, to work uh, safety was a proactive approach. So putting a smart cone like five miles before, the, before construction uh, or a queue, two miles, one mile, the smart cone will measure the traffic flow, the speed, the volume of the traffic, and send the information to the next smart cone. And we'll tag it again and start trending on the possibility of potential hazards that are coming towards the work site. And then the cone that's at the work site will start to interact with the workers at the site or the first responders. For example, the lights could change color, which we know that's not a great idea with, you don't want to confuse drivers, but that's a possibility. We have audio, so you can sound off an alarm. Uh, the challenge with that may be if you're in a situation where it's loud and the decibels are so loud that you can't hear an audio alarm, so there's a potential for a failure there, but it's also important. And then we have tactile alarms, which a wristband that can vibrate. And our, our goal there is to give heads up to the responders on site before the threat gets too close and it becomes a reactive situation. So we're doing our first installation of this in North Dakota at their mass transit project in uh, early June. And that'll be our first program there. Just to give you a little history from where we uh, came from. And then uh, another example of where we are working with other utilities where they have a downed wire situation in a potential, uh, um, like a tornado goes through or whatever it may be, then uh, they, they'll be putting smart cones around that. And the smart cones have passive infrared sensors and laser trip wires. And so if anybody gets too close uh, to the uh, downed wire, an active wire situation, it'll provide a custom audio message that will actually say, uh, this is a hazardous location, you need to please stay back. And those messages can be uploaded by someone's phone. So they can call in and they can create a custom message to interact with the public and, uh, and also inform the, uh, the operator on site of the local where the uh, situation may be. And that's where we are with SmartCone.